We're live. Okay, we're live. Okay. Good morning, Mountain Valley Middle School Facebook family. Ryan Casey, principal of Mountain Valley Middle School. Coming to you this morning after a little bit of uh, uh, stress and trial, but we were resilient and we persevered. And so Gary Crocker and I are here with you this morning. First, I want to start off by saying welcome to a new week. Um, all Mountain Valley Middle School students, virtual fist bump to you. I hope you have a great week. I know um, eighth week of going through this distance learning. I know it's probably getting to be uh, uh, something that's a challenge, but again, we just got to focus on moving forward. If you've had a couple of rough weeks, you can always do better. Continue to check in with your teachers. Really hoping that this morning is something special. We, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to start by saying, um, Gear Up puts on a special event each, each year. And we, we try to take and have a perseverance or a resiliency day where we invite a guest to our school. Um, that guest typically comes and, and does, a, does a pretty good presentation. Maybe it's a, a story, a personal story, or a little bit of connections to what we're trying to accomplish with Gear Up. And so with the Gear Up team, the Gear Up team's goal is to, is to really work at gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs. So simply put, work with students and, and trying to show them those best, those behaviors that people have that are the most successful for their future. So whether it be going on to college or whatever trade that you decide to work at, there are certain characteristics that people have that make them successful in their future. So at Mountain Valley Middle School, our Gear Up team really works at finding opportunities to, to give children, our students, a chance to experience those type of people. So this year, we were supposed to physically be in the presence of Gary Crocker. So Gary was gonna come to our school, he was gonna tell some jokes, talk about uh, being resilient and persevering. He was gonna talk about his own stories. Um, he had some great research about some of our staff members he was gonna share. And so then all of a sudden this pandemic hits and we are told that we can't be at, physically at school. So in the true, uh, true state of gear up and uh, resiliency, we decided we are going to do a virtual uh, presentation. So Gary was willing to join us and hopefully all you students and some of your families were able to watch his video, which he shared some, uh, shared some of the research, certainly made us laugh. I got to tell you, Gary, as I get ready to turn this over to you, I wasn't sure about how well, uh, where your sources were with some of those stories. I thought they were pretty good. It was pretty good, pretty interesting though. So I guess what I'd like to start with is just say good morning, Gary, welcome you. And maybe you could share a little bit about who you are and, uh, and where you got some of that research to start this day out. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. And you're right, this is resiliency. We're doing it, we're proving it, we're living it right now. This is an actual real life example. You're faced with something. They used to say, if you, if you, someone gives you lemonades, you don't make lemons, give, make lemonade. So we're making lemonade right now uh, and it's gonna be tasty. But uh, my name is Gary Crocker. Uh, I was born in, in Lewiston, Maine, as I say. Grammy used to say Lewiston. Anyone pronounce it Lewiston from away. So uh, uh, I grew up in North Monmouth, and I went to Monmouth Academy, where O.O. Howard went to school, by the way. A little history there. O.O. Howard was a general, a major general in the Civil War, fought in Gettysburg, among other battles. And uh, at the end of the war, established the first black university in the United States of America, Howard University down in Washington, D.C. So uh, Mom McCabe turned out a good fella and then me. Anyway, uh, wait, uh, I grew up there. I joined the U.S. Navy. I've done a bunch of things. I worked for 40 years for the Maine Community College System, which I'm a big, big fan of. And uh, during that time, I began to establish myself as somewhat of a main humorist going around making remarks and observations. And I've spoken in nearly half the, country, or the states in the country, all the way to California, Texas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Pennsylvania, all up and down. Uh, and I've had a great time doing it. Uh, and I've had resiliency moments <laughs> throughout my life. Uh, one thing I've learned is that uh, you've got to ask the right questions. You know, asking the right questions is, is really halfway to the answer. If you don't ask the right questions, you're going the wrong direction. I'll give you a good example. 
Ryan, you may recall when you were down in, uh, you went down to Washington County doing a little road trip that you took down there, doing some research yourself, and uh, pulled up in front of that store. And it was, it's a, it's a nice little store down there. It's got a bunch of steps, high steps, and go up to a porch. And there's not that much business in Washington County some days. So the owner of the store was sitting in a rocking chair, much like the one I've got right here. And there was a big dog sleeping right there, right next to him. Yeah. Well, you remember you stepped out of that car and you looked up. Now, you're a little nervous about dogs you're not familiar with. So you call it up to the fella. Hey, fella, does your dog bite? Fella kind of grinned at you and said, no, my dog don't bite. Well, you bounded right up ten stairs, and that dog, whose name was Queen, he met you halfway, took a chunk out of your leg, about as big as my fist. You whirled around, went right back to the car, jumped in the car to protect yourself, put the window down, and yelled up at that fella, hey, I thought you said your dog don't bite. Well, says, my dog don't bite. That's not my dog. You've got to ask the right questions there. You know, <laughs> find out the facts before you act, and, and that'll get you halfway to... To, to positive territory. But uh, yeah, resiliency comes from facing situations like that and refusing to quit. By the way, you still went back in that store once you wrapped your leg up with a bandage and so you weren't gonna, you know, bleed to death or nothing. But uh, and I appreciate you letting me tell that story too because you know, the students are gonna wonder about you from time to time after they heard about my research. And I should be honest, my research was done uh, well, uh, Lisa Drapple was a big help. Uh, she she really reached out and uh, touched everybody. She just found details about people's lives that I was really shocked about. Uh, and, and her willingness to share so much information about so many people that she works with, or used to, uh, <laughs> that uh, I, was, I was just amazed. And the truth is, and please, students, understand, the stories that I tell are classic main stories that I like to put people into to make it a little more interesting for the listener. Uh, and uh, so now here's the facts. Uh, that wasn't research based on truth, <laughs> but it was research and, uh, and it could have happened. That's how I like to put it. Some of those things could have happened. We don't know, we'll never know because in many cases, people are gonna be reluctant to, to agree that they did whatever it was I said they did. So, but understand that my research is based on humor uh, and not uh, academic excellence, if you if you wanna put it that way. Gary, I, um, I'm i not sure. I think that story might've been more about Mr. Millage, but may, maybe not. Maybe it was me, maybe it was Mr. <laughs> Millage, or one of us that that happened to. Uh, so I want, <laughs> so I want to ask you, what are you, what are your thoughts about uh, Mountain Valley Middle School kind of taking the risk of doing this uh, gear up presentation virtual like this? Well, I have to say, I think it's it's uh, it speaks highly of not only the leadership, but as I understand it, because we failed to get up live last week, there was uh, a lot of people were waiting for the opportunity to see us have this chat. So that means that not only did the, uh, the leadership in the school uh, the, and the teachers and everyone else that's been involved uh, think this was a good idea and uh, I had the, had the courage to go ahead with it, but other people jumped on board and said, hey, if we can't do it live in person, let's just do it. Let's find a way. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it reminds me, you, you might have shown a picture. I don't know, you, did you show the teaser? That I that we put together. Did everyone see that? Absolutely. Those students and all of our parents, all of our Facebook friends, they saw that picture of that accident. Yeah, I, you know, I guess what I would say is, you know, we were faced with, you were faced, not me. I was getting ready to come up and visit, and I was looking forward <laughs> to my trip to to the Western Maine. You know, I I don't get out of the house that often, and here I am trapped again. Uh, but uh, I was looking forward to coming up and meeting students and meeting faculty and meeting you. We've never met in person. So this is my virtual handshake right there, dear. There you go. <laughs> but uh, when, when, everyone, when everything kind of 
all of a sudden, and I mean, as we all know, all of a sudden, it ended. It stopped. The world, in fact, I had a gig, uh, a humor presentation at the club, Calumet Club in Augusta the night before the shutdown. So I got through the gig and was still, they were, they were talking about it, but they hadn't actually said no. Well, the next day, it was over. In fact, I had, I think, 20 gigs uh, scheduled for the next few months, and uh, every one of them got canceled. Two of them, actually. I've done one live, just like I'm doing this one, and, uh, and this one. I've had two survive, so it shows the courage that your school had, and you had personally, uh, and I appreciate it. But getting back to that teaser, you know, when you're faced with a difficult situation, sometimes you just have to forge ahead. And I think that teaser is a great forge ahead resiliency kind of story, although it's kind of weird. But I want to make sure everyone knows. I'm going to show you the picture one more time because I want to make sure everyone knows nobody was hurt. It doesn't look that way when you look at it. So is that showing up all right? Absolutely. Great. All right, so everyone's got a good visual of what I'm talking about. That right there, that is a, well, it was a hard top car. <laughs> it's a convertible, but it was only converted once. <laughs> a friend of mine was driving between Jackman and Rockwood, Maine on Route 15. That's rural area of Maine. As I like to say, if you're not, in, if you're not on Congress Street in Portland, Maine, you're in rural Maine. That's about the extent of what we got going here. But Anyway, he was driving on Route 15 between Jackman and Rockwood and whistling right along, pretty good pace, and they come up on a, a dead moose, a huge dead moose laying half in the road. Well, they stopped because they didn't want a car to hit it and have trouble, so they, two rugged boys, they stopped the car, get out to move it, and as they pulled it out of the road, they realized it was still warm. It had just been hit. It had just been killed by, probably by a big logging truck is what they thought. Well, at any rate, they got uh, back on the road after they moved the moose, and they come up behind this car right here. And this car was driving 15 miles an hour, one five, 15 miles an hour. There was an 84-year-old fellow driving and his 86-year-old wife sitting next to him in the passenger seat. Neither one of them had a scratch. But as you can see, the roof was torn off, the windshield was broken down, and in the end, this car was total wreck, according to the insurance company. So. He pulled over next to him, pulled right up next to him. You can have a conversation at 15 miles an hour. It ain't that difficult, really. Put a window down. So he put his window down. The fellow's driving at 15. He's hunking down behind the wheel, kind of looked over for a second. My buddy hollered over. He said, hey, did you just hit a moose? The old fellow says, yeah. And he really did say, yeah. And uh, so the fellow says, my buddy says, pull over to the side of the road. So he pulled over. My buddy got out of his car and they walked around, took that picture. And finally they get into a chat with the old fellow and his wife. They said, now listen, you just hit a moose back there. Are you all right? Oh yeah, yeah, we didn't get hurt. I said, really? Well, why didn't you at least stop? He said, we couldn't stop. Well, why, why not? Well, mother and I go to town uh, once a month to get groceries. Yeah, and this time we bought ice cream. <laughs> Think about that for a second. <laughs> he put his life at risk for a gallon of seal test ice cream, which they don't even sell anymore, but they still sell up there because it's left over from 40 years ago. Anyway, so my buddy just shook his head. He said, oh my goodness, but it won't over. No, he looked between the seats of the car and unbelievably between the seats, there was a cell phone sitting there. So my buddy says, hey, why did you call 911? He said, huh, I didn't know the number. So, you know, you gotta, you got to figure people can still bind your hip. He was still moving forward. That man was resilient. He was going to move for forward. He was going to save his ice cream, get his wife home safely. Just for the record, my buddies loaded him into their car, drove him home, saved the ice cream, and, and had the car towed, which eventually, as I said, the insurance company said, yeah, that there, that's a total wreck. So he was driving a wreck at 15 miles an hour and saving ice cream. But that's resiliency. That's a good example of a fella 84 years old saying, I can do it. I can make this happen. It's an amazing story. We, uh, we appreciate that story so much. Um, 
I wanted to ask you, uh, Gary, just a couple of thoughts. I know you've been making people laugh and telling stories for, for a long, long time. Um, as a middle school, middle school is one of that, is that time in life where things change so much and, and sometimes things are really easy and sometimes things are really rough. So perseverance and sticking with it and kind of moving forward like the couple you just talked about, really important for a middle schooler. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, how best middle schoolers can, can move forward. And then I, I thought maybe you as a, as a storyteller, as somebody that uh, makes people laugh for a living, how you might be able to address middle schoolers when, when they get caught up in, in sometimes making people laugh, there's a, there's a victim or there's somebody that's got to be on the bad side of that story. How do you recommend the middle schoolers to kind of be a, be a good person and do what's right while they're trying to enjoy life and, and telling stories and making people laugh like you obviously do, which so much of us get a benefit from? That's a great question. And I'm asked that all the time. Uh, you know, Robin Williams, a famous, obviously a famous uh, actor, a famous comedian who has passed away. We lost him a few years ago, uh, told a story. And I'll tell this before I answer your question directly, how he, he was asked in an interview why he had stopped doing stand-up comedy. Because like Robin Williams, not at his level, but like Robin Williams, there's nothing I enjoy more than being on a stage in front of an audience that's enjoying what I'm, have, what I'm saying. So he had stopped doing it for several years. And the, the uh, interviewer said, well, Mr. Williams, why, why have you stopped doing something you love to do so much? He said, well, I, I was doing a show a couple of years ago and there was a heckler in the audience. A heckler says somebody, I've never had much difficulty with hecklers. Storytellers in Maine don't get heckled all that often. But in the big city and big crowds, this occasionally somebody thinks he's funnier than the guy on stage or he has something, a point he wants to make. And so he starts yelling things at the performer. Well, Robin Williams was a certified genius. Not only was he funny, he was a genius. And so Robin Williams was explaining that the first thing he did when his fellow started hollering was he used his standard lines to, to shut him down. He said, you know, I've got the mic. You're in trouble. You've brought a knife to a gunfight. You know, you, you better sit down, be, care, be comfortable, enjoy your evening, and turn away. Well, two or three of those efforts failed, and the guy kept it up, and he kept getting worse. And he said, now this is Robin Williams telling the interviewer. He said, I, I stopped at that point, and I looked at the audience, and I said, you're going to have to excuse me for a few minutes. I'm going to take this guy apart. And he did. And when the show was over, he, the guy was in tears when Robin Williams stopped. And at the end of the show, Robin Williams said uh, to this interviewer, I sat in my dressing room and cried because it is not my job to make people feel worse. It's my job to leave them feeling better. The whole, I'm doing humor posts every morning uh, from West Gardner. It's called Tales from West Gardner, Maine. I hope I hope folks will check it out. It's on. I put them up on Facebook, and then I also transfer them to YouTube, so they can get them by just googling Gary Crocker Tales from West Gardner, Maine. So, as far as middle schoolers are concerned, it is a life. It, it's a moment in time that I recall because it's so powerful. It's so powerful because you're changing physically, emotionally. Uh, in every way, your life is changing. You're, you're screaming along the highway of life toward adulthood. And you don't really know, in some cases, what to make of it. Uh, and, and sometimes it's an easy target. There's somebody that you can make fun of, someone that will bring laughter if you make a comment about this one or that one. And if there's anything I want to discourage, it's that. Because when I tell stories, you're right, Brian, somebody has to be uh, the butt of the joke. The one I told when I started today uh, <laughs> made fun of you. But uh, it wasn't, uh, it, I, delivery has everything to do with how it's received. If it's received, if it's delivered as, hey, this is going to be funny, uh, and Ryan's a funny guy, and Ryan's willing to take a joke, uh, 
it, everybody's in it, everybody's in it, and everybody's happy. But if somebody comes along from outside and isn't part of the performance, isn't part of the understanding of, hey, this is just fun, we're having fun, then it can get ugly. So I just, I really encourage laughter every day. I read something this morning on Facebook, someone posted that uh, there were five things you should do. And one of the things you should do of the five is to smile for no apparent reason. <laughs> That's just to jumpstart that part of your personality. Uh, you don't have to laugh out loud. In, in uh, India, uh, the, the uh, country of India, they have laughing cafes where people go in the morning and they don't even drink coffee. They don't go in to drink coffee and have that kind of, they go in and sit at tables and start laughing. There's no comedian. They just start laughing. Laughing is as contagious as yawning. Everyone knows that if you, someone in a, in a group of people starts to yawn, everybody in a few minutes, everyone will be yawning. It's the same with laughter. If somebody starts laughing, you're going to look first thing you're going to say, well, you're going to wonder what, what, what are they laughing about? But you're going to start to smile. And before you know it, you're going to be laughing too. And you're not going to know why, but it's because it's contagious. So I encourage contagious laughter. I encourage uh, soft and gentle, uh, caring humor uh, among all of us. And especially those wonderful middle school kids who are making that transition in life that you and I struggled through, Brian. Uh, and somehow we made it. We should be examples. If we made it, by goodness, everyone can do it. <laughs> There's a hope for everybody. So I, get, I encourage storytelling. I discourage and joking uh, and laughter above all. Uh, but I discourage uh, making somebody the uh, uh, unintended butt of a joke in a negative, harmful, painful, or ugly way. It is, that is as harmful as anything I can think of, because that carries an emotional scar that doesn't heal as well or as quickly. Thank you so much, Gary. I I, my, I clearly hear from you, and I think it's great. Our middle schoolers, uh, our, many of our middle schoolers get that. That the, but I love when you said the jo the job of a humorist or a comedian is to make people laugh, not make them feel bad. And that that's a message that I think all of us that like to laugh and make jokes we can all remember. Um, so I appreciate you taking time to answer that. I, I, I truly respect um, a good comedian, a good humorist, and I, lo I love to laugh. I love your stories. And I never, ever felt any personal attacks on any of them. And that makes it really fun to be part of. So uh, I'd like to ask you another question, Gary. I know we have a few more minutes with you. Um, I know you're a veteran. And first, I'd like to say thank you so much for your service and your time. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you so many of the uh, qualities that we talk about, the, the perseverance, um, moving forward, stick to it, just being kind, choosing to be nice instead of uh, mean, those, those qualities that people have that make them successful. Do, we're talking about post-secondary and maybe going on to, you know, to college and, and a trade school, whatever. But if a, if a person's going into the military, like, like what you served our country, um, do these qualities uh, serve those type of folks as well? It's absolutely critical. When you're in the military, of course, rules, uh, in fact, there's a term called military justice. Mili we have rules and laws in our country, in our state, in our towns that we have to follow. When you join the military, there's a whole other set of rules. It's called military justice. It's a lot uh, crisper. It's a lot more immediate in some cases. But the, the one thing that military life te taught me is that you are a member of a team. And, and that team is gonna rise or fall uh, based on, in some cases, one thing that you do. So it's, that's why we have military justice. That's why it's so clear what the rules are. And there's a chain of command, starts with the principal, <laughs> and it drops down to where I was sitting. So uh, I, I, would, I will tell you that in the military, uh, you don't ask a lot of questions, uh, and but when I was in, I was in Viet, I'm a Vietnam veteran. So when I was in Vietnam, uh, it was noisy. I was a kid from North Monmouth, Maine. I had joined right out of Monmouth Academy, uh, so I was 18, 19 years old when I went to Vietnam, and uh, I recall 
remember, I remember that every time something bad happened, A, the team was ready because we'd been prepared. We, we learned our lessons. We'd been trained to do what we needed to do. And as soon as it was over, honestly, humor became part of the order of the day. Uh, and I can guarantee you that today, today's military, you're gonna have the same experience, whether they're in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever they are on the planet, they will respond. I have full faith, 100% confidence in our military. They will do the right thing. And it's not gonna be easy in some cases and, and there'll be problems, but when it's over, they're immediately gonna to turn to humor and start joking about what, uh, what happened. What, and sometimes it's dark humor in their cases because that's <laughs> what they're dealing with. But it's just as important, maybe more important in the, in the military than anywhere else to be willing to be resilient and have a sense of humor. Those two things really are, are like two sides of the same coin, uh, responding positively to negative situations and coming out the other side lends itself to having a good positive attitude and a sense of humor. So thanks for asking about my, my service because I'm, I'm proud of my service. Well, thank you so much. And we, uh, we will, I just, I wanted to make reference to it because no time has it been more clear, I think, uh, how precious and important our freedom is. Um, we're all waiting to get back to a, a little bit more, you know, choice and freedom, get back to our schools and meeting together. And so we, I wanted to make sure I thank you so much for what you've done. Gary, I'm wondering if maybe, maybe you have a, a story or, or a, a, maybe a little more research. I don't know if you have something that maybe that you might want to share with this, uh, with this audience before we start to wrap things up. Um, but take the take and offer whatever you have here as we get ready to end up. Yes. First of all, I'd like to tell you a story because I think uh, younger people might appreciate this because they're all looking for summer jobs now. I want to tell them, I, I already told you this, Ryan, but I want to, I want to tell them about an experience I had because it's something I think everyone can understand and appreciate. And I didn't have any preparation for it. What I did it was just came out of nowhere. Uh, when I was younger, uh, most of us in North Monmouth, where I grew up, the summer jobs that were available mostly were on farms or in an apple orchard. So I worked for Chick Brothers Apples, uh, picking apples a lot, but I also worked for farmers. And the first job, the first real paying job I ever had was haying. And I was a little guy at the time. I really hadn't achieved my full height uh, or weight until I, until I went in the Navy. So I was a very small guy, you know, uh, five, 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 six, and kind of skinny on top of that. So some friends of mine came to my house one day and he said, hey, you know, uh, Farmer Robinson, and that was his name, uh, he's hiring hayers, people to just throw his bales of hay. And I said, wow, I can do that. I said, well, yeah, he's looking for people. If you want to come up for more money, I'll hire you. This is my buddy talking, another kid. So I got on my bike, rode two miles up to his farm the next morning at the appointed time. I arrived and dropped my bike, walked over with the other guys because he was getting them assembled, said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the tractor and take the, take the trailer out, the, out in the field. And here's, I've already bailed this hay. We're going to pick it up. And he was explaining what was going to happen to all the kids. And one of my buddies said, hey, uh, Mr. Robinson, uh, we brought our buddy Gary Crocker up. He's, he'd like to work too. Well, he took one look at me. And I was small and I was thin. And he, he didn't even bat an eye. How did he give it any thought? He just said, I think I'm all set. In other words, he didn't need a little guy running around the field that couldn't throw a bale of hay. <laughs> and I could not believe my response. I still, I, this was back, what? I was 12 years old and here I am 72. So it was a long time ago. And <laughs> I immediately, immediately when he said, I, yeah, I'm all set, I don't need any more help. I said, well, can I work for nothing? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you wanna work, you wanna hay all day for nothing? I said, yeah. I said, I rode all the way up here on my bike. I just don't work. He said, okay. Well, I made it up, I made up my mind that that day I was gonna throw more bales than any other kid on the team. And I did. I ran to the bales and ran back to the wagon and threw them on and ran to the next bale. Well, at the end of the day, the farmer came over to me and he said, hey, uh, if you want to come back tomorrow, 
I'll pay it. So I didn't get paid for that day because that was the arrangement. That was the agreement. I was going to do it for free. I worked harder than anybody else. I proved to that farmer that I could do the job. So I, I'm only passing it on because I think it's great food for thought for, uh, for middle schools, especially as they start to think about what they're going to do. It doesn't have to be hanged. Any job would, would fit into that category to show people what you can do, to prove to them that you're capable of whatever the job is that you want to do. Find a way to prove it and be resilient. Come back from, eh, I don't need you to, I'll pay you tomorrow. So uh, I, I, I think that's a, a great story to keep in mind for kids. Now I'm going to be, uh, I, I'm looking at my book because I'm going to be making a gift. That you, you've suggested, Ryan, that you're going to bring me up to the school so I can meet the, the folks I've been talking to. And I hope that happens. And I hope it happens soon. But I've got a book and uh, <laughs> Dave Roberts, if you think back, you probably can't see the writing on this. Can you read that? Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay. That said, The Ballad of the Beantown Bosox, it was written by Daniel Bates, a friend of mine who has since passed away. But I'm gonna I'm gonna make a trip to your school, I hope, and at, at some time in the fairly near future, so I can give one of these to you. It's an autographed copy, uh, and I've got a set of my CDs. I'm gonna give as well. But this book talks about resiliency in the most magnificent way. This book is uh, the story of the 2004 Boston Red Sox. Now, Maine has more Red Sox fans than any other per, per capita than any other state in the country, including Massachusetts, where they play. So Maine people, are, you see, well, you see this hat everywhere. <laughs> yeah. it, this B is recognizable. So uh, with all that said, I'm going to say I was looking for the passage and I'm going to try to do it from memory. There's a particular passage in this book, in my opinion, that is when the Red Sox turned the, t turned the tide and turned the tables and decided they were gonna, they were gonna win this thing. It was the, remember they lost three games in the American League Championship Series to the dreaded New York Yankees. <laughs> in the fourth game, the ninth inning, they were down. They were behind by a run. And uh, I'm trying to think of the player and it's not coming to mind, but someone got a hit. And he went to first base, but he had lead feet. So they put <laughs> Dave Roberts in to run. Most, most Red Sox fans will never forget the name Dave Roberts, who only played for the Boston Red Sox for one half of one season. Apparently, God put him on that team to steal second base, which is an odd thing for God to want. But uh, anyway, Dave Roberts is on first. And Roberts gets paid. To, this is my, the words of my friend Dan Bates. Roberts gets paid to study this guy, he engage in his moves, he's well versed. Roberts looks right into Rivera's brain and thrice as a bullet to first. Roberts gets back easy, then edges from first on his toes, sizes up pitcher and catcher on the pitch to home. Roberts goes. <laughs> Roberts takes off like a butt shot duck. Posada throws hard to Gita. In all of baseball history, would a St. Sean ever look sweeter? I think not. And when he was when he successfully stole second base. The Boston Red Sox said, we are going to win this game and we are going to win this series. So they were as, as down as a team could be. And the next thing you know, they're standing in a parade. And by the way, this book starts with opening day and goes to the parade in downtown Boston. Uh, and it's one, it's just, it's one big poem. It is, it is an amazing piece of work. And I want I want you and your library to have a copy. So don't keep me on your Rolodex so I can come up. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I am going to tell you one story. All right. I'm going to tell you this story because it, it, it talks about how people look at things and, and not thinking things through. The other thing you have to do to be resilient and successful and successfully resilient is you have to think it through. Look at what you're dealing with. Think about what you're doing. Think about the facts and the people around you. Just and, they, and I know that's difficult. It's difficult for me at 72. It's going to be particularly difficult for people uh, in middle school. But this is a great story. 
and this will be have to, have to be explained to, to a few people, but because uh, it's 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 got a it's got a bit of a stretch for younger a younger audience. But this story just nailed it to me. My friend Robert Scoglin is a is a main humorist, uh, much like myself, more successful. He goes by the name the Humble Family. Lives down in St. George, Maine. Well, I was talking to Humble well a couple of years ago, and he said. Uh, Gary, did I ever tell you about Winky? I said, what do you mean, Winky? What What do you mean, what happened? He said, well, if my buddy Winky has got a four-wheel drive and a length of chain. Now, this is just my opinion, but if in Maine you are fortunate enough to have a four-wheel drive truck and a length of chain, you've got responsibilities. You know, if someone's off the road, you've got a job to do, you know? And that's how Winky looked at it, just like I do. So Winky was telling Robert, he said, you know, Robert, you know, that truck of mine hauled anybody out of the mud. And a couple of years ago, he said, I was hauling that. I, I was driving down the old camp road, and I saw that Andy Wyatt, you know, that fellow that painted Christina's World, that famous painting of a young woman in the field there? Well, he said, uh, Andy was sitting his mired in mud. So I drove up, and I said, Andy, uh, you want your truck pulled out of your car, pulled out of the ditch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. help me out. So the, I hooked a chain on, put her in full wheel drive, yanked it up by there, slicker than a bucket of smelt. <laughs> Sat right there and hooked my chain and Andy tried to pay me. We don't take money. We're meanest. We're in this together. Well, the next thing I know, every Christmas after that, every single Christmas, I couldn't believe it. The, the oddest thing would happen. I'd get this hand-painted card christmas card from andy white i mean unbelievable every for 15 years they kept stacking up there at the house and and uh, you know i'm a little upset by it robert said well why are you upset that you're getting christmas cards from andy white he said well gee he said listen a fellow that's that important that's that famous that's made that much money you'd think he'd have the the will that he's a cheapskate he could have gone down to the department store and gone into the the card department and got me a nice, decent Hallmark card. No, no. He just sent me these hand painted things. I've been using them to start the wood stove. So there you go. It's not right, but it's the way it happened. So uh, we got to pay attention, get the facts, ask, ask the right questions, uh, and be resilient. There's always an answer. That's the, the beauty is, that's what resilience is all about. And the, the governor of New Jersey, just, well, when we were going to talk on Friday, I happened to be watching the Today Show, and he mentioned that particular word. He said, New Jersey is going to be resilient. We are coming back from this. Well, and the whole country will. Yeah. But that's the whole idea. you got to get facts, ask questions, think it through, and that leads to good resilience. And I know, knowing you, as, as I do over this little box we're dealing with here, <laughs> uh, and, and Cheryl and Lisa, and everyone has been helpful here. I know that those students are getting the right preparation to do exactly that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Gary. So on behalf of, um, of Mountain Valley Middle School, first and foremost, we are gonna move heaven and earth to get you up here so our students can say hello, uh, present you with a Mountain Valley Middle School shirt that'll say, safe place to learn, be respectful, act responsibly and do what's right. You can wear it with pride throughout Maine and wherever. Um, also like to have a chance to, to at least fist bump, maybe shake, maybe we'll be back to shaking hands. Who knows what we'll be doing by then. But when, uh, when we get that nice autograph book, and we're so thankful for you to present our library with your, your CDs and the book, uh, our kids will love it. Our library is a fantastic place, central hub of our school. So um, again, just on behalf of Mountain Valley Middle School, I want to, I want to thank you so much for, for kind of thinking outside of the box and doing this with us today. Sorry, we had the glitch on Friday, but it was well worth the wait. I hope that um, our students will all see this videotape that they didn't see it live today in their classrooms. Uh, all their teachers will share it with them throughout the week. So thank you. And uh, I appreciate you. And we look forward to meeting you actual physically face to face someday. So and hopefully someday soon. So uh, in the meantime, I'd like to just read a quick message to my uh, to my my Facebook family and my students before we check out. And and uh, if you are you OK with that? Yeah. All right, absolutely then. So on behalf of Mountain Valley Middle School staff, um, we wanna thank all of our students, all of our parents 
for being such a great part of our community. We hope that you've enjoyed our Resiliency Day presentation and our guest, Gary Crocker. Um, we, we, we challenge you all to stay strong, remain healthy. We want you to know that we miss you, that we care about you. We think you're fantastic people. Um, we're what makes Mountain Valley Middle School what it is. And uh, we cannot wait to be together again soon. So thank you. Signing off from Ryan Casey and Gary Crocker live on Facebook.